Anyway, let's just worship the Lord this morning. Uh, give Him all of our praise and all of all the honor He's due. Amen.
that you're going to continue to keep doing, Lord, that your goodness never runs out, and it chases us down wherever we are, in the midst of our busyness, in the midst of what we're going through, that your goodness follows us. It goes before us and behind us, Lord. So we thank you for that, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must end So I throw my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah And I know it's not much, I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response, I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide. If you're here right now, he's been good to you. Oh, you've been so, 
something I didn't deserve Oh, I couldn't earn it He's been so, so good to me He's been so, so good to me This is my testimony He's been so, so good to me He's been so, so good to me. So one last time, can we sing this out? So I throw my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have, I and I know it's not much of nothing else fit for you, King, except for a heart singing hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Spirits in the room, and God, I'm giving in to you, beckoning. I can sense the call of your spirit, it's a still small voice, but I hear it. And lead me in your ways, breathe upon my faith. There's a place where there are no limits. You won't relent till I'm in it Cause you don't want a surface Relationship, you more than this So take me on a deep dive, deep dive Into your heart And show me every detail Unveil all that you are all that you are, yes, Lord. For all that you are, all that you are, we want to know you. Sing into the unknown. Into the unknown, Father, come and show that your spirit's never been hiding. It's the faithful ones that keep finding Yes it is Cause I don't want to surface Relationship I want more than this So take me on a deep dive Deep dive Into your heart And show me every detail Unveil All that you are Oh and take me on a your heart and show me, show me every detail and all that you are, all that you are, yes Lord, we want to know you for all that you Show me what's breaking your heart And even if it messes me up Cause I don't want to know you in part I want to know you, really know you Don't want to reach the end of my life Knowing there was more I could find Cause I don't want to know you Come on, can we make that our hearts cry this morning? We want to know you more so show me what's breaking your heart Or oh, even if it messes me up Cause I don't wanna know you in part I wanna know you, really know you Don't wanna reach the end of my life Knowing there was more Cause I don't wanna know you in part I wanna know you, really know you 
into your heart show me every all that you are and take me on a into your heart and show me every all that you are all that you are Take me back to my first love 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 The reason I was created was to bring you praise, Lord To bring you praise Oh, to know you a little deeper Oh, to know you a little more, Lord We want to know you, really know you Wanna know you, really know you. We wanna love you, really love you. Take me back to my first love. I wanna love you, really love you. Bring me back to my father. I wanna love you, really love you. Bring me back to my father. I wanna love you, really love you. Oh, realign my focus on you, Lord. Really love you. Oh, bring it back to my heart. Yeah. I wanna love you, really love you. Oh, set it fire, set it fire. Oh, set it fire, no.
God of miracles, that you are the God who's on time, that you are the God who never stops working, that you are more than able, you're more than able to move in our lives, Lord. Right now, I just pray a prayer for anyone who feels hopeless, for situations that feel empty, for whatever feels like it's too big. I pray a sense of peace would just pass over right now that your healing power would move like it never has before in their lives, that they would see their miracle in Jesus' name. God, we thank you for it, and we praise you for it. We thank you for this time where we've, we've been able to come together and worship you as one community, as one body. And God, we just pray that you would open our hearts to receive the word this morning, that we would receive it with open hearts and open minds, that the soil would be ready for you to come plant seeds this morning. So we thank you for it, and we praise you for it, and everyone said, amen. Amen, amen, church, amen. Happy Sunday, church. I'm Sarush. And I'm Christina. And today we have the pleasure of reading the scripture from Genesis 6, 1 to 8. Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. 
In those days, and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry for he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them, but Noah found favor with the Lord. Have a great Sunday. Good morning, good morning, Windsor Christian Fellowship. How's everybody doing today? Good, good, good. It's good to be here. Um, you know what? I just wanted to say thank you to SEU Worship for coming and joining us and leading us in worship today. Um, they have such a gift that they're, they're stewarding so well to the Lord, and um, they've been such a blessing to this house this weekend, um, and we just pray that the Lord would bless them as well. So if you get a chance to see those guys later, just uh, give them a good hello, and uh, they're, they're great people to be around. But uh, um, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Um, who's here for uh, the first time? First time here. Anybody first time here? We got a couple right here. Anybody over here first time? Right here. Awesome. Well, we just wanted to take a second and welcome you guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, you guys are always welcome here, and uh, we, just, we just pray that you guys would feel loved today, and um, that every single person that's here um, would walk out a different person than they came in. Amen? Amen. It's a, it's a good day to take a deep dive into the heart of the Lord. Yeah. Why don't you, uh, everybody, if you just turn to your neighbor uh, and just say, it's good to be here. And, and now turn to the other neighbor and say, whatever you're going through, God is more than able. God is more than able. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, at this time, kids and junior youth, you're dismissed. That's right. You guys go have some fun down in your classes. So, who's excited for Tyson Authorings? We have actually a new way to give here I'm going to introduce to you guys. So um, as, usual, as usual, you can always give online. You can give your tithes, you can give your offerings online through our mobile app, uh, through the website. We have uh, Teddy give us a little wave. The ushers have some envelopes if you'd prefer to give cash. You can give at the Welcome Center. And we also have a, a new way to give. Um, we have two kiosks out in the front foyer, main foyer. We have one in the Children's Church foyer as well down the hallway. Uh, I look at Matt here, uh, just stewarding his finances so well, giving his uh, at the kiosk. So you'll see those right out front. That I make it nice and easy for you guys as well. So just join me as we pray for the tithes and offerings. Father, I thank you so, so much just for the opportunity to worship you, Lord. Um, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to give and um, to just lay down and, and steward the things that you've given us, Father. We just pray a blessing over each and every person in this room, God. We just pray a blessing over the tithes, over the offerings coming in, Father, that you would take that such small seed and you would make it expand and grow and grow and grow. And we'd see just this amazing impact that you have on our region, on our country, and on the world, Father. We thank you that we get to be witnesses of what you're doing, Father. And, and we just thank you just for the opportunity to give. It's such an honor, Lord. It's such an honor to walk in obedience, Father. And, and you've called us to do this. Lord, you know what's best for us. You love us so much. You've asked us to do this, and we just thank you for the opportunity to just reciprocate and give back. Lord, you've given so, so much, God. We, we, we just, honestly, God, we're just in awe, and uh, we just thank you that you are more than able in any and every situation. Father, we pray a blessing over each and every person in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So the new seniors ministry, Chairs of Hope, uh, there's a meeting uh, Tuesday. Uh, April 16th? April 16th, yeah. I heard something about pizza, something about a pizza, a yeah, pizza gathering, pizza party. party, family feud for the seniors ministry, April 16th. So don't miss that. Last week, uh, we were blessed with a, an amazing Easter message. So Good Friday, we talked about Jesus as the lamb and how he came in so humbly and gently. And then on Sunday on Easter, um, blessed with a message on Jesus as the lion. How many know he's coming back um, different than he came the first time? Uh, with a mighty roar. Amen. Amen. Uh, this week, we are going to continue our series on the days of Noah part two. So uh, welcome on uh, Pastor RJ and Pastor Larry on uh, the Nephilim this week. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good to see all your smiling faces. <laughs> 
So we are continuing this conversation on the Days of Noah Part 2. A few years ago, we did Part 1. A few years ago. It's a while ago. Part 1, yeah. So anyway, Part 2, Days of Noah 2, we've been working through, uh, you know, image bearers and the attack on the image bearer. We've been working through Satan's agenda in the earth how he's trying to destroy humans. And there's been some foundational pieces that were laid for this message today, which will be um, continued over the next two weeks after this. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation that we're beginning today. And, you know, in Genesis 6, we saw the foundational verses that uh, Sarush and Christina read for us. And I want to go to Genesis 1 to just kind of set a, a tone for today's conversation in verse 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign. In the beginning conversation that God had about making humans, they will reign over the fish, over the birds, the livestock, the wild animals, the small animals. And then in 27, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. We know about that part, fill the earth, be fruitful, and multiply. We hear that. But then he says, and govern it. Reign over. And then he lists the animals, okay? And, and he goes on and he, he says in verse uh, 31 that he saw that it was good. So God made Adam and Eve in his image, man and woman in his image, in the context of ruling or governing the earth. And literally in the Hebrew, if you were to look at it a little more literally, one way to render that would be to reign over and bring into submission yeah. all things on planet earth. And I like the way that uh, the psalmist adds to that in uh, Psalms 8 verses 4 to 6, where it says, what are mere mortals that you should think of them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. Just an incredible, you know, expansion on what Jesus initially um, spoke to Adam and Eve regarding, you know, the authority that was theirs here again over a thousand years later, again, expanding on that very, that very fact that human beings were created to have authority over everything that God created. So Satan, I mean, obviously he wanted to rule over heaven, which is why he rebelled against God. And that didn't work out so good for him. And um, Jesus said something about, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven to earth. Yeah. But he wants to govern earth today. But there's some problems with that for him, uh, primarily that God gave the right to rule to his image bearers, to his representatives here on earth, humans. So humans have the delegated authority from God to govern the planet earth. Now, in Genesis 3, it appears that Adam surrendered his right to rule when he fell into the temptation of the serpent, and he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, he disobeyed God's direct command to not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, but this right to steward the earth was really given to the sons of Adam. It was given to the children, to humans, uh, the children of Adam and Eve. Uh, and angels were not permitted to rule the earth. Okay. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, it even talks about, it says, we're going to judge angels, not the other way around. And, and what happens is... Um, there's a lot of, I'm going to say, misconception, I guess, around the differences between what would be a fallen angel or what would be a demon. And a lot of people don't differentiate between the two. I'd like to point out some things that we've noticed from starting in Ephesians 6 that might be a little bit different. For we are not fighting, this is Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Would you say there's like a rank and file in the kingdom of darkness? Yeah, it seems like it. We get, you know, and not just here, but even in other places, we, we seem to get that understanding is that there's a, there's a hierarchy of, of the demonic. 
So what would be, you know, some of the differences or one of the primary differences between an angel and maybe a, a demon or an evil spirit? So based on what we read in scripture, there's, there's two distinct things that we, we pick up on. Angels have bodies, demons don't. And um, some of the examples that we see of, of angels in the physical form in scripture, uh, Hebrews 13 verse 2 where it says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. And, you know, I can actually think of stories, even in my own life growing up as a kid, where, where somebody appeared to help my dad with a, with a broken down car and fix it. And then all of a sudden, they, they, they just disappear. Um, you know, you know, you see this even in the scriptures in Genesis 18, where the angels yep. visited Abraham, or in Genesis 19, uh, where uh, they visited Lot. You know what I mean? To remove him from Sodom before judgment fell. Daniel 10, where the angel sends a message to Daniel. Uh, Luke, an angel visits Zachariah. John the Baptist dad. Oh, yeah. He was serving, and he saw an angel. Yeah. And then he couldn't speak. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Mary and Joseph both saw angels. At the tomb. At the tomb there was an angel. Yeah. And then if we were to look like in Matthew 8 where Jesus cast the spirits out of the demoniac at Gadarene and they went into the pigs or in Matthew 12, it says when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes in the desert seeking rest but finding none. It seems that demons need some sort of a host to possess and to activate their lust through. Uh, there's other scriptures that talk about where they throw people into the fire or they cause harm to the host or they control the host um, within there. A little bit different in operation, I think, than how the fallen angels are operating. We see examples of demons wandering the earth to and fro, seeking whom they may devour. But at the same time, angels don't. Angels have access to heaven. Um, demons don't. We see references of that. Um, even in scripture, fallen angels are called angels that sinned, whereas demons are called devils. Yeah, yeah. So all that said, um, and we're going to talk about some theories in a minute, and, and, and the good part is you get to choose one. No. <laughs> but where did the demons come from is probably a question at this point we need to oh, answer. Yeah, 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 we were going to do that at this point. So yeah. you had that from Logos. Logos, Logos.com states, in ancient Jewish texts like the Dead Sea Scrolls, demons are the disembodied spirits of dead Nephilim giants who perished at the time of the Great Flood. And so with that context, though, of understanding, we need to explain a little about bit about who the Nephilim were. And, and Nephilim, in simplest terms, means giant or giants. Mm. And there's somewhere between 23 and 42 that I can count references, depending on which translation you're using, to giants or giants um, in the land, uh, whether it's Anakins, uh, the Emims, the Rephaim, what was the other one? Oh, and Nephilim itself. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all the giants. It's always talking about these giant races that existed in these giant cities or these communities of giants that banded together. So it seems to me at this point, and we're going to talk about the different theories in a second, but that these hybrid human fallen angels, okay, so if a fallen angel went and created a baby with a uh, human woman, it was a ploy of Satan to corrupt the seed um, of humans, to destroy the pure human stock. And um, if you look at, the Bible in Genesis 3 where God is addressing the serpent and the man and the woman when they fell into sin. He prophesies at that point in Genesis 3 that the Messiah is going to come forth and he says, it's, I'm going to put enmity between the offspring of the man, or the woman, sorry, the woman's offspring and the serpent's offspring. And it says he's going to crush your head, yeah. meaning that the Messiah is going to come forth and crush the head of the serpent. And and there was a prophecy there that Jesus fulfilled um, a little bit later when he came. But also connected to this is an added bonus because angels didn't have the right to govern, even though Adam had surrendered that right, the half humans with their human side would have been able to govern the planet Earth um, or that right to govern or that right to rule. 
So that would have been an added bonus to creating these hybrid creatures. And, and keep in mind, mankind was created good yep. and innocent. And even children today are born alive before God, right? They're all born in innocence. So it's not until sin enters in later that people fall into um, the curse or the law of sin and death and they're separated from God. But because of that, you know, I think there would be a difference in, in the birth of a uh, pure human who's born in innocence and someone who came from a fallen angel, at least as far as their nature is concerned and, and um, their desire or their ability or their inherent ability to do good in response to what the Spirit of God is working out inside of their life. I think I said that how I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I just want to make sure I get all of the data I wanted to talk about here. Satan was trying to destroy God's plans on earth by destroying the seed of woman. So Jesus, when he came through his biological mother Mary, and, and obviously human and God, 100% of both, while he was here on earth, what I want you to understand is he demonstrated and conquered and, and exercised authority over food. and water, Like he turned water into wine. He, he multiplied the, the bread and the fishes and fed the multitudes. He commanded the storm to be still. He walked on water. He transcended the elements. He cast out the demonic. He exercised total dominance and control over the demonic world. He healed sickness and disease. He relieved people from the curse. He forgave people of their sins. He even transcended time and space. I mean, there was one miracle where he was with them on the boat and instantly they got to their destination. It was like they time traveled. Like they just transcended time and space. And then he conquered death. Jesus demonstrated total and absolute control over the world that he created. Yeah. And then the great part is in Matthew 28, he makes this crazy statement and says, all authority has been given to me. Yep. But I now in turn designate or delegate that authority to you, my followers, who are identifying with me in the death, burial, and resurrection through baptism and repentance and belief in the work that he did on the cross. The Christ followers, the ones that take on his nature and character, you actually have the ability and obligation to exercise his authority here on planet earth now as we take the kingdom of God and we go out and we, we expand it. So coming back to the topic of Nephilim, yes. as, you, as we stated earlier, Nephilim simply means giants. When you, when you break it down from a he, the, the Hebrew context, Nephilim means giants. And, uh, and like you stated well, as yeah, well... Some some believe in the fallen ones. I see a lot of definitions like that, but they kind of take that from the Hebrew root, right? The, the Raphael um, or the fallen uh, root word. And, and sometimes you can get yourself into trouble when you try to define a word based on the root that it was developed from. Yeah. Um, that's, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. So Nephilim, if we talk, when we're talking about the Nephilim, we're referring to giants. And, um, you know, initially when uh, we're, we began conversation about we're going to preach on the Nephilim, I'm like, yeah, how long is that going to take? Well, it won't take very long because I only knew of the one passage in Scripture, Genesis 6, which was read. And uh, as I dig into this, oh, my goodness, references in the Bible to giants is astronomical. Like, I mean, it just blows my mind. Just in there again and again and again, they talk about this. So here's the three theories of who the Nephilim were uh, that are listed in Genesis 6 and a couple other places. The first theory would be the sons of Seth. And we find this adhered to by, um, you know, some Christian scholars, uh, ministers uh, will adhere to this theory as well. And it's the righteous men from the line of Seth um, breeding or intermingling and marrying the unrighteous women from the line of Cain. Mm -hmm. So Seth's godly descendants fell in love with the beauty of the women who were descendants from Cain. And um, the sons of Seth would have had to marry these women who rejected God, and then it produced wickedness. Now, this is kind of, this theory has a little bit of weight from Genesis 4 and 5 when you see a description of the two distinct lines where you had uh, one genealogy from the line of Adam and one through Cain, or sorry, Adam's through Seth, genealogy through Seth. And then you see another one through Cain and his lineage. Um, but um, at that point, 
we'll come back to the challenges in a minute. Why don't you go to the next theory first? Okay. So the second one is sons of kings or wealthy royalty, uh, men of high position, judges, kings, etc., having relations with other women with low social status. And um, one of the, they take this from, you know, in Genesis 6, verse 4, where it says, these were mighty men um, uh, who were of old men of renown, uh, kind of referencing this, uh, this aspect of, of men of, a, of position, men of authority. Um, and it's also, they use Psalms 82, verses 6 and 7, where it references that wicked men uh, preying on the oppressed, it, it kind of like as gods. And the passage says, I said, you are gods, you are all sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere mortals, you will fall like every other ruler. So this theory really depends on the belief that the sons of God were immoral and abusive to the women that they chose and took for themselves. So we're going to talk about these two first, then we're going to go to the third theory, which we're actually going to probably develop more over the next few weeks. And um, I think we both landed on the third theory theory for the sake of this conversation. And I'm going to tell you what some of my concerns are with the first two. Uh, the first theory is where did the giants come from? If human men married human women, then how did giants happen? And there's over 30 or like 30, 40, depending on which translation you use, references to giants in the Bible that existed. And uh, when I say giant, I'm talking about people of abnormal strength size that were mighty warriors, not just Goliath. He was one of the littler ones. Yeah, but we'll talk more about that. In future weeks, yes. Yep. So um, some, it, it's going to require faith in any theory, right, to kind of get there. The people that adhere to the line of Seth say that the mark on Cain would have been a, a physical abnormality that was reproduced in his offspring that created the giant races. So it doesn't really account for that. It accounts that there's a mark on Cain, but it doesn't tell us what it is. So there's some speculation that has to happen for us to get there. And then the other part of that that um, is a little bit unclear to me is because like in verse one, it talks about all humans. And then in verse two, it's just the humans in the line of Cain, but it's using the same word men or mankind. And then in verse three, it goes back to all humans. And then in verse four, it's back to the line of Cain. And like, you kind of have to keep changing the definition of the word mankind or humans in order to kinda, make that work. kind of land there to make that work. Yeah. Um, so I don't feel that it's really uh, being intellectually honest with the text as far as uh, interpretation yeah. of it at that point. And um, the sons of king or the wealthy ones, um, there's really not a lot of evidence for it except for the theory that it was the wealthy merchants that married the people that weren't wealthy and had kids that became heroes. <laughs> Probably the least favored of the three. Yeah, you find that more with secular humanist scholars yeah. that want to discredit anything that the Bible really uh, talks about, which leads us to the third theory. Fallen angels. So exactly who were the fallen angels? Um, so when Jesus Christ um, wiped out or sent Satan and a third of the angels to earth, they would have been fallen angels. Yes, they were the ones and, that were um, fallen. <laughs> yeah. So these fallen angels um, actually looking upon the, the women of humanity looked at them as desirable and pleasurable, and um, from their satanic agenda um, to destroy the kingdom of God and the seed of, of, um, of God, um, had relations with these women, marrying them and having relations. And the result of that, that marriage or that conception was these Nephilim or the giants. So just to kind of give some explanation of this, because... Like, I feel that this view is very consistent with the attack on the image bearer that we've been kind of talking about, um, especially from Genesis 3. But I, I want you to think, if there's a difference between a fallen angel and a demon, disembodied spirit that has to possess a person to activate its lust. So, because a fallen angel can just appear in the natural realm. And um, most people, when they shoot down this theory, they say, well, why would a woman want to have sex with a demon to create this half-breed <laughs> between a human and a demon? But I think if they understand that fallen angels, like, okay, like, ladies, if you were single and Thor walked in the room and he was single and he was, you might want to go on a date with them. 
you might find that appealing. And, and around that time, there was this prophecy that God said, look, the days of man, I'm not going to put up with this no more. They're 120 years. So all of a sudden, these people who were immortal, designed to live forever, okay, and they live for a long time, the beginning of Genesis, before yep. the flood, you know. If I could um, procreate with a God, um, maybe my children could gain eternal life. Yep. Or position and, and, and there's authority. This, yeah, there's this concept of eternal life without Christ, right? And we'll come back to that when we get to transhumanism in a few, in a few weeks. But, you know, there's another aspect of this that I wanted to mention in the yeah, first yeah. service, but I forgot. Yeah. Is just when you think about like pre-Diluvian, you know, maybe we would just highlight oh, Diluvian. <laughs> the flood. Diluvian just means the flood. So pre or anti-Diluvian means before the flood, post-Diluvian means after the flood. But before the flood, the only ones that were saved was Noah and his family, his three sons and his wife. So what? why not the rest? And the understanding is, by theologians, is that by that time, the rest of humanity had been corrupted by these fallen angels. Like, that's a lot of fallen angels. Or a lot of fallen people. A lot of fallen people. <laughs> but anyway, so getting back on track, I, you know, I just found that something of interest. Because sometimes we don't really mentally process, like, the extent of the, of the deception. So here's some scriptures to consider when you're thinking about this. Yeah. 1 Peter 3, 19 to 20, 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude, verse 6. They all seem to talk about the sons of God or these fallen angels. Uh, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and 38, 7 also references angels as the sons of God. Yep. It, doesn't, it doesn't really refer to humans in that context, at least in these passages. Now, the biggest, I'm going to say, kick against the fallen angel theory or the biggest uh, mark or blot that people use on the fallen angel theory is the words of Jesus in Matthew 22. It says, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. So this is talking about in the spiritual realm, in heaven, yeah, he's right? Yeah, talking to the Sadducees who didn't even believe in the resurrection. Yeah. They will be like angels in heaven. So in other words, it's saying that angels, they're not going to marry or they won't give to marriage. But if you really look into the, like, the scripture in its entirety in that passage, it says the text doesn't say that the angels can't marry, that they're unable to marry. It just says that they won't marry. They don't. They don't. So anyway, something to think about. Moving on from there. We went through post-Diluvian. Post-Diluvian. Well, after the flood... And, and in Genesis 6, the verse that Sarush and Christina read for us, you know, um, in those times. And times after. And afterward. Yeah. And so there's this concept of, well, where did the Nephilim come from after the flood? Or how yeah, did they were all giants... destroyed during the flood. Yeah. And, and you're going to love this because we actually come to different conclusions on this conversation at this point. Yeah. Mine's correct. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but we're still friends and we're not going to argue about it. No. So why don't you talk about the um, quasi-correct view first? <laughs> so um, one of the theories is that um, the Nephilim, the seed of the Nephilim was passed on through Ham's wife. That Ham's wife was actually from the seed of the Nephilim. And, uh, and so that the entire lineage of Ham uh, through Canaan. Canaan, well, it's through Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan are the sons of a Nephilim gene. So, and specifically, we find it through scripture that, that the sons and daughters of Cain, Canaan, um, we find throughout all of scripture in the Old Testament that they have giant characteristics, um, which we'll talk more about at another time. Yep. But anyway, so that's part of the, the evidence leaning towards the fact that the corruption happened through um, Ham's, I mean, sorry, through Noah's son, Ham. And I think I talked about that a little bit, but a lot of the Canadi 
Canadian. Canadian. A lot of the Canaanite tribes yep. um, were giants. They were. They had giant communities in them. And when Israel went in, God empowered them and enabled them to wipe them out, which also leads me to think about why would God want to wipe out man, woman, and child when the children may or may not have done anything? That's a good question. Think about genocide in the Old Testament. It's a hard concept, but you have to trust that God is good no matter what, you know? So a lot God is the one that can understand justice. But yeah, and alongside of that, yeah. they were commanded, you know, in some communities, destroy all of them, and then in a neighboring one, don't Leave touch the city them. city alone. That's Leave right. them alone. That's right. So, but um, that's the one theory um, that Pastor Larry landed on for the uh, post uh, Diluvian. So after the flood, how the Nephilim were on the earth. For me personally, I just, I feel like there was a second incursion where some other angels decided that it, it would be a good idea to, to, to go with humans. Maybe not as many as the first time around because there was a, a higher consequence by this time because it says God locked them up in a place called Tartarus. If you're reading uh, in Second Peter, um, they, they had left their first estate and he judged them and said, no, you don't get to do that anymore. Uh, there's a whole lot of other theories out there that, are really kind of silly, like the Nephilim built rafts and they floated around for a year and a half. Uh, silliness, okay, yep. don't, don't, don't. Or, or, or they don't became aquatic. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's where we get Atlantis today. But um, anyway, I, I, I think that some of that's a little bit of a stretch. Uh, that said, because we're out of time already, <clears throat> um, next week we're gonna continue this conversation with, I'm going to call them interdimensional beings, okay? Um, some of you have been hearing more and more about aliens. Mm -hmm. Has anyone read an article about aliens in the last six months? Seeing yep. more and more of this conversation about aliens, and I'm not a big fan of aliens. I don't believe in aliens. I mean, they make some funky things in movies, but do they really exist? Not likely. Uh, but I do believe that there's spirit beings that exist. I believe that there's demons, and I believe there's fallen angels that exist. I believe, just like I believe there's good angels that exist, and they can appear in both the spiritual world, yep. that dimension, as well as the natural dimension, as is demonstrated through the scriptures uh, in some of the verses we talked about. So we're going to be talking about the reality of the obscure. We're going to bring some other concepts in to kind of build on this when we get back together next week and we talk about, uh, but keep in mind, our overarching purpose in these conversations is this is how Satan is operating in the earth in past times and today so that we can be aware of his schemes and not fall prey to them. Yeah. I think I said it a few weeks ago. Tomorrow there's an eclipse. Listen, the world is not going to end tomorrow. Your world might, but the world as a whole, God is not going to end the world tomorrow. Okay. That time is not here yet. And I know you're like, but it could happen any moment. Uh, maybe, but I still think there's some things that scripturally have to happen yep. before we get there. <clears throat> so if we're reading the scriptures, it talks about some conditions for Christ to return. Right. Not just when he feels like it. Yeah. He prophesied some things. So let's not, let's not get caught up in the hype. If you want to go watch the eclipse, go enjoy it. Uh, but as far as is the world going to end and, you know, nah, not likely. Yeah. You know, and I, if I can just add, like, if, if the topic of the Nephilim seems to be a big stretch, you know, one of the songs that we sang in worship, I think the last one, you know, look what the Lord can do. Nothing's impossible. You know, when you have, when you get a room of faith, nothing's impossible. And, and if we can just highlight the reality that if Satan is bent on destroying God's kingdom and his plan for humanity, look what God can do. Let's focus on that and, um, and just, you know, let's pray more. Let's, you know, if anything else, if I can say anything, we need to be in prayer. The enemy is active and he is looking for ways to destroy the plans of God for humanity. And we are all part of that plan. So he's after you. So stand up with us. Yeah. You know, Father, as we come to the table today to partake of the Lord's Supper or Communion, I thank you that you had a plan before you even created the world for us. 
and you knew, foreknew the things that were gonna happen and the mess and the nonsense, and even leading up to the situation that each and every one of us find us in today. Some are in good situations, some not so good. Some life is really messy, some are confused, some are broken and hurting. But Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to planet Earth mm. to die for us, to restore the way, the pathway for righteousness, to peace, to joy. That you've empowered your people, God, to live with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead living within us. And Jesus, you made a way for us to be free from the curse, to be free from sin, from sickness and disease. And we declare life and health and wholeness over everyone listening today. So as we come to the covenant meal, I thank you that we can partake of the brokenness of Christ and celebrate his death till he come. In Jesus' name. And Father God, as we remember with your cup, with this cup, we remember the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, your shed blood that covers over our shame, our guilt, our sin, and enables us to enter boldly to the throne room of grace. And just say, thank you, Father, for your great love, your mercy that has made me worthy to be your daughter, your son. And Father God, that has enabled me to carry with me the authority through Jesus Christ over the giants in my life. May we always be reminded of your blood, Father God as we face giants on a daily basis, as we find victory because of Christ, to live in victory because of Christ. And we call out the name of Jesus over and over and over again. And we just say, thank you for your blood. Thank you for dying. Thank you for rising again. Thank you for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we carry with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name. So as Dave and Carolyn are coming up for the benediction, I just want to encourage all of you. We had SEU here this weekend imparting to our worship teams. Had a nice time worshiping on Friday night. Sessions all day yesterday. They were with us this morning. Uh, there's cost involved in bringing people in as guest speakers, so please contribute to the guest speaker tab. Uh, Feel free to contribute an offering and sow into, sow into the worship movement that's happening down there and going globally and sow into our own worship team. And so as you're, as you're um, praying about what to give on that, feel free to do that. And it would be a blessing to help offset the cost. Uh, God bless you guys. You guys are... Good morning. So <laughs> I think... Probably all of you would agree that this morning, um, our worship team, um, in unity with SEU worship, has taken us on a deep dive into worship. Um, it was an amazing, amazing time, and followed by our pastors who took us um, into a deep dig into scripture this morning. Uh, we are truly blessed, and we thank you for the message this morning. Uh, the Lord has given me two scriptures um, this past week. Uh, one is an admonishment and one is an encouragement. The first one is from Matthew 26, verse 41. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Um, as Pastor Larry stated, uh, we need to be in prayer. Prayer is not an option in our Christian life. We all need to be in prayer. And our that communication in our relationship with God um, is so necessary and, and just so important uh, for our daily walk with him. 
And the second scripture is from Deuteronomy 31.8. Because sometimes when we hear messages like this, we can think, it, you know, maybe it's scary or, you know, it's, it's unknown. Um, I learned a lot. I didn't know a lot about the Nephilim. But the Lord also wants you to be at peace because he says in Deuteronomy, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you and he will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. This is something I wasn't expecting anybody here today with their wife. Look at him and say, you look good. <laughs> Reminded about this teaching on authority, how uh, powerful it is that it's been given to us. We know that we have an enemy that's trying to steal that from you. With that in mind, I was reminded of the story, the woman that went up to her prayer room, gets up before the Lord, gets on her knees and says, Father God, before we get started today, I have to uh, confess the sin that I got into yesterday. And uh, I seen it coming. I did it anyways. I'm really sorry for it. And uh, I just, uh, then the phone rings. She runs downstairs to get it. Sorry, Father God, it's really important. I got to get her. And she comes back to the prayer room and she says, Father God, I'm repenting of that sin. And you know, the one we were just talking about, and she hears a very bold, no. She says, yeah, the one we were just talking about, you know, that I did yesterday. And he says, that sin is thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. It is cast as far as the east is from the west, never to brought, be brought back up again. And I just want to share that with you because the enemy is very uh, vivid on bringing up something you did wrong yesterday or last week or 25 years ago. He's good at bringing her back up. So just uh, take the authority that's there and realize that when God looks at you, he sees you clothed in righteousness. He sees you as what Jesus has done for you to be forgiven of all your sins. So take the authority that's given us, use the attitude that he's given you, and, uh, okay, think of attitude. I was brought up in a neighborhood where we didn't have a lot of stuff. I never remember a basketball net. One girl had a baseball bat. We used to say that we were in a really fortunate neighborhood because every household had 3.5 kids, and out of the four blocks, we always found something to do. One of the major pastimes the older guys would get in a circle in somebody's backyard and they would have two kids fight and uh, try and even them up we found that um, sometimes a kid that's a foot shorter 20 pounds less than the guy he's fighting won he won because he had an attitude he went into that fight saying I'm going to win I'm going to come out the other side victorious I share that with you because that's how you have to get into your prayer mode. We're going to come outside in this place victorious by the authority that's given to us because of what Jesus did. With that in mind, we'd love to pray for people up here. There's people up here that will be here for intercession. Uh, so come on up. Feel free. And uh, Windsor Christian Fellowship, you have been equipped. Now go. Don't fight. No.